Early farmers were eating these hideous roots thousands of years ago and replanted the biggest and best of them, hoping to grow only the best possible crop. And carrots used to be white like this, and then they went, when they got bigger, they went through a stage where they were purple, and we still have some of those too. And then, several hundred years ago, one group of them came out orange, whence came the, most, the, the much more appealing carrots that are most common now. Are you old enough to remember when we used to eat watermelon that always had seeds in them? Well, look how much worse it used to be so many generations before that, when they were all about seeds with not much left that we could eat. Same thing with bananas. Did you ever notice their seeds? You would if you had a sample of the original wild type because they're full of seeds. They're tougher too. You have to cook them to eat them. The mutation for soft tissued sweet yellow bananas first occurred in Jamaica in 1836. That's how recent that mutation is. Since then, many other cultivars have been developed from them so that we now have the five-sided seedless variety too. Look how humans derive what are now several different cultivars of corn out of what was originally a Mexican grass called tiacente. This grass and corn only differ by a handful of genes. Early farmers didn't know that. They were selecting which ones had the longest ears, the biggest and most kernels, and so on. So when a mutation happens that makes any of them better than what they were already eating, they will, of course, prefer that and plant more like it. So that pretty soon, you know, several generations or seasons later, the whole crop looks like that. So we developed these foods and nearly everything else in the produce department through several sequential centuries of artificial selective breeding. While religious extremists may pretend that there's no evidence of evolution, we've actually been using evolutionary principles throughout the entire history of agriculture, and we've only just recently begun to understand the mechanisms for how selective breeding works to refine and develop better produce. The same goes for how we, we evolved all the different breeds of dogs and cattle, poultry, fowl, and so on. Now, believers usually respond to that in one of two ways. Most commonly, you'd say, well, that's just microevolution. We accept microevolution, of course, but not macroevolution because they're not the same thing. One is real legitimate science, and the other is Darwinism. I've been debating with creationists almost daily for a quarter century or so, and every time, they redefine and mystify evolution, macroevolution, Darwinism, all of it. To date, none of them have ever understood what macroevolution even is, and they make up distorted definitions to hide that from themselves. But to my experience, none of these creationists really understands what microevolution is either. They don't even like to say that word. They try to say that it's just adaptation or use some other term that doesn't really apply. No. Evolution in general is a process of varying